Hey, everybody. This is a little better. Um, a minute ago, or a few minutes ago, I started a live, and for some reason, my camera was just not turning on. It's really weird. Um, but I got it set up now. So um, welcome. Welcome back to Income School. I'm glad to be here live with you today. I'm going to be taking questions uh, about anything. Um, let me know what you want to know about SEO, internet marketing, uh, affiliate marketing, etc. Um, so thanks to all of you who jumped onto the other <laughs> stream first and who uh, uh, got a little bit, um, anyway, a little bit of a weird surprise there. So thanks everyone. I see uh, we're starting to get some people joining in here in the room. Um, so hi, hi to all of you. Um, let's see. All right, we've already got some questions coming in. Um, one thing that I've been, by the way, I, I'm gonna start taking questions in just a second here. One of the things I've been really, thinking about a lot lately is um, just kind of how important it is to kind of get back to some of the basics. There are a lot of things in internet marketing that um, are taught, that we teach, that, you know, we kind of get on and stuff. But like, there's some really important basic things about um, SEO, about content creation, and about um, affiliate marketing that um, oftentimes like we overlook because we're looking for kind of that, I don't know, something big, something really exciting that's going to be a, a game changer, a silver bullet. And um, the reality is focusing a lot of times on those important foundational things is really important. And so um, as I've been thinking about that, I, I've discovered that there are a lot of things that we just kind of know internally here at Income School, things we've been working on that we've like never really taught um, because to us, they just seem like the basics. And it's because they're very important, but We've been doing it so long, those things are obvious to us. So anyway, there we are. So you got a question here. Um, Inigo Navarro-Rubio asks if I'd be open to doing um, an open niche site challenge. Um, yeah, I think I would be. Something to keep in mind um, with everything that I'm doing here at Income School, um, all the different things I manage in Project 24. Uh, I, it's funny, I'm like way busier than I ever was when I had a real normal job, um, <laughs> but I love it. And honestly, um, I do like to create content. I like to, you know, do it myself as often as I can. So um, just kind of depending on what the details of the challenge were, yes, I'd be open to doing something like that. Um, DJ Delo says, Jarvis is a huge question. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? You know, I don't have thoughts on Jarvis right now. Sorry. Don't really have anything to share. There's a lot of huge questions in internet marketing. Uh, Casta Allen, does a shared hosting account affect SEO? No. Um, shared hosting specifically doesn't. In fact, there's a not fairly recent video actually um, put out by Google that, uh, that addresses this. The fact of shared hosting isn't the problem. The problem is when that hosting gets really bogged down. People say that, well, if it's shared hosting and somebody else um, that's on that same hosting, you know, maybe has a site that gets penalized. Does that impact your site? No, it doesn't. Um, Google does their, their ranking based upon the, the URL, the domain, not based upon, um, where it's hosted. And so that's not really an issue. There is some shared hosting that's very fast and there's some private hosting that is not at all. And so really that's not the question. It's more of just how good is the hosting? All right. Um, more another questions here. Lots of them. Um, site audits. Bradley Bernie asks, site audits. Um, I'd love to do site audits. I, I'm assuming that's the question is if we'll do them. Um, I I would like to. We're, we're looking at ways we could implement that. It becomes very time consuming and often hard to do, but we'd love to do that. What is in the Project 24 YouTube course from Sami Ula? Um, there's a lot of stuff. We have a whole lot of um, like skills-based content in the YouTube course right now. So the biggest thing that's missing right now from that is kind of how it all fits together into a system. And so that's something that we're working on right now. And hopefully in the next couple months, we'll have it out there in Project 24. But Nate, um, who's the, uh, the face of the Channel Makers channel, uh, he's been hard at work on that. We've been meeting about that a ton regularly. Um, trying to kind of kind of hone in on what that system looks like and there's some really cool stuff coming so there you go um baz asks how do you speed up article research and writing 
We actually have a, a good YouTube video on this. It's a couple years old. Uh, it's called The Perfect Blog Post in One Hour, I believe. Um, that's really what I would share here. Now, there's additional research to do beyond that. That video shows how we quickly are able to organize our thoughts um, to be able to research and write an article very, very quickly. However, um, as often as possible, I would add to that more original research. If there's something that you can do to do some of your own testing, um, talk to an, an expert directly in some kind of an interview, um, gather some sort of data that you can aggregate, um, et cetera, that's going to add a lot more to the post than just doing research online and finding the answers based upon that. Um, the other thing is if you can separate the research as much as possible from the writing time. So what I like to do is if I'm working on a, a site or a new YouTube channel or something like that, I really do like to spend my free time just kind of getting into that industry. I'll listen to podcasts. I watch YouTube videos and I just learn as much as I can. That's going to do a lot more for saving you time on research and writing than any other like tactical thing you could do at the time of writing. All right. Lots of questions coming in. I'm going to take, we got a super chat here from Firma Co. Uh, best wishes from Germany. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thanks for, thanks for that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see. About what I posted in the last video. Won't Google flag it as duplicate content when you add it to more than one page? I actually wanted to address this. Um, and in fact, I still might in like a YouTube video on our Income School Tutorials channel, but I'd be happy to address it here in a quick fashion. In that video, what I showed was how you can make a reusable block and fill it with a few of your top recommendations for affiliate products, things that you would recommend to basically anybody that comes to your site. Um, and then you could put that in your post. I showed putting it at the bottom. You could put it wherever it makes the most sense. And then by saving it as a reusable block, you can literally just add it to every other blog post that you want to put it in. Um, one, I would recommend not necessarily using the same block for every article on the site. I would maybe create one for each category that's a little more customized. Um, Adam over at WP Crafter showed in a video on the same day how to take that same concept. And if you're using the pro version of many themes, they're going to have a way for you to be able to create that. Um, I've done things like that with, uh, with Divi to create some custom layouts for blog posts, but you can do custom content and then create rules and have it just appear in every blog post in that category. So then it's automa automatic. You don't have to add it in. You don't have to go back to your old blog post and add it in. It's pretty cool. So, um, so that leads the question, isn't that duplicate content? Well, here is what, um, Google actually says about duplicate content, and it's basically that uh, the only type of duplicate content they care about that they would penalize is if you're duplicating really substantive comment or content. So whether or not it's copy and paste or even like um, spinning content from another website without adding any real value, even that um, can be treated as duplicate content. Oftentimes that duplicate content, it won't necessarily receive a manual penalty but it will be impacted from an SEO standpoint if Google can tell that the original content comes from somewhere else. Um, it's debatable whether or not Google actually does that. Sometimes it really is the spun content that performs better in the end. Um, but still, when it comes to just taking small elements from a blog post and repeating them on other blog posts throughout the site, Google doesn't care about this. Um, this is a small piece of the content, whereas the meat of the article is different in every single blog post. So the substantive portion of the content varies. Having um, you know one block of text that repeats itself on your site is a lot like having another block of text below that, which is usually the author card with a picture and a piece of text that appears again on all of the blog posts written by that author. That's also duplicate content, but it's also not. You could also say that you get duplicate content anytime that you have, um, you know, like if you put one blog post in multiple categories, well, on those category pages, the same excerpt will show up multiple times on your website. So, and on the main blog archive page, is that duplicate content? And so that's really the, the question there. And based on, upon what Google has said and our experience with, with Google and with search, uh, no, that doesn't, um, 
that doesn't actually have an impact on SEO. So there's my long answer. Um, I'll probably even have a more in-depth answer with quotes from Google in a YouTube video here on the Income School Tutorials channel before too long. Okay, Corey Rollins, thanks for the super chat. Um, he's asking what camera and lens I'm using for this live stream. Uh, what I'm doing, this is kind of fun. I've started doing this um, for live streams both here and then I do a lot of um, live stream or live, it's less of a stream and more of just like a discussion, a group meeting uh, inside Project 24. I am using um, an actual real like normal camera. It's a Sony A6500. Um, and then I'm using a micro HDMI cable or mini HDMI, whichever it is. Um, and I link from that to a cam link, which is like this little, it looks like a USB flash drive, but it's a, what it is, is a, it takes that video and it, then I can put it in through a USB on my computer and it uses it like a webcam. Um, I tried plugging it directly into like an HDMI port or something. It doesn't work quite as well. The cam link really solves that problem. So it's like a hundred dollar cam link, but with a camera, like a, a normal camera. And then the lens on it is a Sigma. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm going to find out for you. Let me look. Yeah, it's a Sigma 16 millimeter lens um, that uh, we've been using for a lot of YouTube videos for a long time. So it's basically the same camera that you see us on our YouTube videos, but it's connected. And then I'm using a Rode Podcaster microphone to get a little bit better audio too. So thanks for the question. Um, got another one from Cooper Time. Hey, Ricky, Project 24 member with a two and a half year old site. 120 posts, 35,000 views a month. Good job. Zoic EPMV is still only about $4 plus a few affiliate sales. Is it because the niche is crowded and any tips to raise this? Um, I don't think it's necessarily because the niche is so crowded. Um, what I would say is uh, if you're not doing well with ads, it could be, well, it's, there's several things it could be actually. Um, it, it could be the ad layout itself. Are you taking advantage of kind of the most um, beneficial ads, ad placements? Um, one of the highest earning ad placements is right at the top. I hate it. Um, you know, one that's like above the title of the blog post. I hate that. I hate pushing the content down. I'd rather have a better ad experience. And I found that even without that ad placement, I can do really well. But I also like to take advantage of anchored ads as much as possible. So there's the anchored footer ad that you can get um, and an anchored sidebar ad. And those ads will stick with the user as they scroll down the page. And then once sort of the maximum earnings have been reached by a specific ad, it'll switch out and show a different ad in that same spot. And so those tend to be the highest earning ad placements. Um, anchored ads, uh, the anchored footer ad does well on mobile. The anchored sidebar ad doesn't because the sidebar moves to the bottom below the content. And so really nobody gets to those. Um, another thing you can do this actually makes a big difference on desktop is leave as much sidebar space as possible for ad placements. A lot of people fill up the sidebar with too much stuff. Um, by default, WordPress typically puts like a whole bunch of recent posts and meta stuff and recent comments, all these things there. Um, I get rid of all of that stuff. I only have a couple of things in the sidebar and then leave as much room as possible for ads. Um, that, again, that doesn't help with mobile users, which make up a lot of viewers these days but it makes a big enough difference on desktop that it helps. The content itself, we can improve that by um, making sure that, first of all, the content itself is very friendly to a wide range of viewers. Um, if you take at all like an approach that's um, that alienates any group at all, and like I, I don't mean that like, like we're being um, prejudiced at all, but rather... Um, you know, if you have a site that's got kind of a really grungy feel to it and a really manly feel to it, it's kind of a turnoff for a lot of people, um, even if it's really good for that specific group of people. And so um, that is going to impact your ad earnings if you decide to go that route. And I, th and I think it's okay if you want to build a site that kind of caters to a specific, a specific kind of demographic within a niche. Um, oftentimes that can be a way to break in. But um, just know that if it's not like super overall friendly, just to um, middle-aged people, to older people, to younger people, 
um, it's going to have an impact on which ads will display. A couple other things to consider too is like with Azoic, like any other platform, it does take time. So depending on how long you've been with Azoic, um, you're going to see those earnings go up more and more over time. With Azoic, that seems to continue um, even beyond sometimes what we get with others with other ad networks, simply because their AI is going to continually try to optimize those ads for you. So part of it is just giving it some time. Um, but yeah, making you make sure that your content, the images, the design and everything is really friendly to a broad audience. Um, those types of things are going to make a lot of a difference. Um, there you go. Also, more ad placements are going to do better, but that's going to impact your, uh, your traffic. Um, let's see. We got another one here, and I saw one. In fact, there's a couple here I missed. Moshi, Karim, uh, thank you for your super chat. And um, Itachi Gaming, do you run any academy to learn directly from you? Well, yeah, so we have Project 24. Project 24 is our membership, um, and there you do learn basically just directly from everything that everything that we've learned, uh, me and Jim and the rest of the team, everything that we learn, um, we teach and we share inside Project 24. We have a members only podcast where we're sharing kind of the latest, even before we fully ready, we're fully ready to teach it in a, in a course. That's where we're just talking about the things that are top of mind and highly relevant. But we also have course content changing and adapting and improving all the time. So there you go. Joshua B. Birkins. Burskins, sorry, says, was going to do the Battleship course, but noticed many of my year-old posts were never indexed. Do I now need to wait an extra year after being indexed? Um, I would still do a content audit of the site. What you're going to find is that those posts basically have no traffic at this point because they weren't indexed. Um, and so those ones I'm probably just going to leave alone but I would still do a battleship audit of the site. And you'll see um, the reasons for the no indexing. It's kind of hard. Google says that they only index content that their algorithm thinks is actually going to show up for a search. And so oftentimes if we write an article that's on just such a niche down topic that there just aren't really searches for it, um, then when Google sees that that's like the only topic of a blog post, they might not even index it at all. Um, I don't think that's the only reason. Uh, there are plenty of others. Another is just if it's going to rank far enough down um, the list that nobody's going to click on it, um, it also may not get indexed. If it looks to Google like the type of content that people don't go to, um, like, um, for example, there are a lot of pages on our websites that Google won't index simply because it's not a page that's really intended to show up in search results. So, um, it's just not going to be indexed. Um, sitemaps, you know, for example, are often not indexed. Uh, but uh, there are other pages oftentimes on our sites that mm, don't really get indexed directly. So um, anyway, there's there's uh, a, a lot of reasons why that might be happening. Um, in terms of battleshipping, though, I would mostly just leave those pieces of content alone. Um, or I would reevaluate them from the standpoint of search analysis to try to decide is there something about the topic itself that just makes it not likely to be searched? Um, there's anyway, there you go. Um, I want to make sure I'm not, there's a lot of questions that come in. So I just want to make sure I'm not missing any. Um, I don't, I don't only answer super chats by the way, but um, I, I often try to give them precedence. Um, here's one that just caught my eye here. Um, Cyan Saga says, why news articles get to the top of the page right away? Um, the reason is, is that like if you're using um, schema properly and you have news related content and you've kind of established yourself as a trustworthy source um, in Google's eyes um, or a source rather that seems authoritative enough, whether or not, you know, we're not going to get political about it, but um, that seems authoritative enough then what happens is uh, Google knows that news content has a very short cycle. And so Google's going to promote that content immediately. They're going to surface it immediately. Uh, whereas a lot of the content that we write is not really news specifically. Um, sometimes it might be you know product-related news or something, but for the most part, um, that's not what it is. It's more of an evergreen type of content. And the content that it's competing with is also that way. And so Google is going to take a little more time. Their algorithm, rather, is going to take a little bit more time. 
Um, Hamza Ali asks, what tips or strategies would I use to go from 4,000 a month to 10,000 a month? How many blog posts? So um, I do have a video coming out, uh, hopefully on Tuesday, um, a little bit about, not specifically this, this is taking a site that's only six months old, has, you know, income's not even really a thing on it yet, and turning that into the full-time income. Um, and, but the principles there, I think are going to be, they're going to be exactly what you should probably be doing at this point. Um, it's not always about just adding more content. Um, the video is going to go into uh, optimizing that content, uh, some of that content a little bit more for um, for commercial, whether that's you know ads, selling your own product, um, as well as uh, um, what do I not say? Oh, affiliate marketing. So um, it's going to go into all that, but basically it's about the type of content we work on at this point and how we're going to structure the content on our website, linking between posts and such. So um, not exactly siloing, kind of topic clustering. Um, it's kind of a new strategy that I haven't really taught before, but it's one that I think is going to make a big difference. The other thing, um, the other thing that I would do between to get, you know, up to that 10,000 and even higher mark is um, oftentimes at those levels, I'm looking at treating this as like a, like a real a business, not, not just like a site, something on the side, but as a real business. And oftentimes that means um, uh, creating my own product, an info product, um, potentially a physical product, but usually an info product. Um, that oftentimes is kind of the big opportunity for um, income growth, even without necessarily, again, adding a ton more content. Um, that's a big one. Uh, the other thing though you can do if you want to keep it passive is potentially branch out and start another site. If the site that you're in is already just kind of full, you've got the content covering everything. And now it's kind of a matter of optimizing. Um, there you go. There's, there's a couple ways to do it. So basically you can take what you've done and do it another one and a half times and you've got your $10,000. All right, I better get to some of these. Um, Cooper Time says, last time I asked about a poll plugin. Uh, tried Forminator, Yop Poll, and a poll by Total Sauce. They didn't work. Um, or they work while you're setting them up, but don't seem to work on the front end. Okay, Cooper Time, I actually did look into it for you. And I am going to find the name of it again. Um, there's one that definitely works with Akabato. Just got to <laughs> remember the name. But I'm going to pull it up. Uh, because you did ask that last time. Here we go. What was it called? This will only take me like a few more seconds, I hope. Um, crowd signal. So with crowd signal, you go and you generate the poll on their website and then you can embed it on the site. They do have options to do pop-ups and all sorts of other things. With Akabato, a lot of those don't work too well, partly because by default, Akabato disables jQuery. There is a setting in Akabato um, to enable jQuery uh, that should help, but it doesn't, it doesn't always, a lot of these uh, plugins that have kind of the pop-ups don't seem to work. But with CrowdSignal, you can embed a poll um, anywhere on the site. You can embed it in like in the sidebar. You can embed it um, inside of a blog post or on a page. Uh, it's not going to get the pop out effect, but I, you know, if you try to make it stand out, you know, um, with your design a little bit, I think you're still going to get most of the impact of it. And I'm going to be working on um, that with Akabato, finding a basically the ideal solution of what I want, you know, which plugin I want, and then making sure that we're compatible with that. So there you go. Um, all right. Chris uh, Heidelbaugh says, can you speak on the pros and cons of using a personal name versus a niche name for YouTube channels, podcasts, and websites? I'm a web designer and I like to teach people, but wonder about using a personal name to grow online. And he says, God bless. Thanks, Chris. Um, yes, a little bit. Okay, when it comes to picking a domain name for a website, um, I think a lot more about branding than I do about kind of what the name means. <clears throat> when you start a new website or a YouTube channel and it's just the name of the person, um, at first the hard thing is if there's no name recognition, then when people see it show up at a search result, they're like, I don't know who that is, right? Um, that's more difficult on a blog than it is on YouTube. On YouTube, you can change the name of your channel at any time. 
And so you could start it off with a niche based name um, just to kind of make it easier for people to identify kind of the topic of the blog of the YouTube channel rather. And then um, you could uh, over time, like at some point you could kind of make that shift. Uh, a lot of YouTubers have done that where they decide to focus on um, their personal brand and their name. And then they use that to allow them to just kind of open up and make the content about maybe a broader range of things, not just kind of the one specific niche they started in. So that's one way to approach it on YouTube. Um, but as far as, you know, blog YouTube using your personal name versus using the name of the niche or a, a descriptive name, um, frankly, I, I don't think it terribly matters a whole lot from like an SEO standpoint. Um, it, it just, it doesn't like, we don't need exact match domain names. That's doesn't matter anymore. So, um, then it just is, you know, when that name appears in the search results, does that matter? Again, it matters a lot less than the headline that is shows for the content, you know, um, the title, you know, of a blog post that appears in the search results. And so the question then is long-term, like, which is it that you want to build up? You know, if I were to make a website, um, so you said that yours, you know, um, was about, okay, web designer or whatever. You know, if I were to make a, web, a website that was like, I'm trying to find like an ideal domain name that includes something about web design or even just design in it. And, um, you know, everything's taken. So now I have to pick a domain name like, you know, uh, web design essentials, you know, uh, for you <laughs> because web design essentials, like so many of those are already taken. Uh, I, no, that doesn't matter to me. Would I pick maybe a brandable name that kind of gives the feeling of web design? Um, that's normally what I would do in part because it allows me to potentially sell that down the road. I could sell the site. Um, whereas if I built a website that was rickykessler.com and I taught web design, it's really hard to sell that asset. Um, it's very tied to you as a person. Now, if this is something where you're building it up, it's your career, you're not going to leave that. At least you don't ever intend to. Um, and so building a brand around yourself is not something you're worried about um, because you're never going to try to sell it. Then absolutely, I think it's a great idea. A lot of uh, a lot of people who are taking more the influencer route are choosing to do that. And I think it's I think it works just fine. All right. Cyclon Hyder says, what is the future of affiliate sites and SEO? Um, I think the future is still strong. It we do are we we are seeing like shifts over time. Obviously, Google is um, Google is deprioritizing. I won't say quite penalizing, but deprioritizing sites that are very affiliate heavy, particularly when the content doesn't add additional value. And I think that's one of the big problems in affiliate marketing is a lot of bloggers have tried to go the easy route. So what we do is we pull together information that we find across the web, um, whether that's, you know, in Amazon reviews for products, uh, even recipes. Like I saw a recipe site I was looking at just today where I was like, I am not convinced the person who wrote this has ever made this item. But the recipe, the story, everything in it looks, it looks legit. But based on what I know, um, by working in so much in this industry, I'm like, I think this person is scraping content and spinning it, honestly. And they're doing it effectively right now. Um, and so as people try to kind of go that easy route, Google's getting wise to that. Um, as people are aggregating Amazon reviews and basically just writing an article that's like telling information that is like, okay, the people that gave it a one star, they said this, and the people that hated it said this, and that's my pros and cons list, um, plus some of the product specs. You know, I, that's not really adding any real value um, other than, you know, somebody doesn't have to read the direct reviews. Now you've kind of aggregated that, I suppose. Um, but it's almost more trustworthy when it is clear that it comes from somebody who actually used the product. And so Google is pushing that, right? And so what we are seeing, though, is that for people who are doing things, I would, I would say the, the, the right way or a better way, where people are adding additional value by the content they create, not just putting content out there and hoping some of it does well. Um, they're still doing very, very well. And we're still seeing sites today that start up and are earning a fantastic income by just doing the methods we teach. 
um, with some affiliate marketing, some um, some ads, et cetera. So to me, the, I see the future is still being very bright. People are still going to continue researching products online before they buy them. People are still going to be looking online for how to do things. And in those kinds of articles, those are great places to put affiliate links. And so uh, that's not changing. And I don't see AIs being able to do an adequate job of most of that kind of content anytime soon at all. Um, so to me, it's I'm still very optimistic about the future of it. Um, obviously, though, things will things will start to change over time, and we just have to keep our eye on it. And that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we're doing all the time is keeping our eye on it. Um, Marco Wong Baez says, "Hey Ricky, do you recommend including a blog in my Shopify store? Will it help increasing sales?" As a matter of fact, I strongly recommend this. Um, whether that blog is like hosted the same place as the Shopify store or you self-host it um, and then kind of link back and forth between the two so that, it, you know, it feels the experience is um, consistent or I believe with Shopify, I'm not personally um, using it, but we have Project 24 members who do. Um, I think with Shopify, you could even embed a store on your site, if I'm not mistaken. So um, basically, though, with the blog, what you're going to be doing is finding people who are doing searches around the topic. Um, things where by searching that, it, it maybe makes it clear that they're probably considering making a purchase in your industry. That's how I would um, maybe target my search analysis is um, toward those types of searches. Um, and then, you know, people read your blog post and they're like, hey, cool, this is really helpful information. And you say, now, if you want to see my product that solves this problem for you or my product that is in this industry, here it is. And you link to it. Um, it's like affiliate marketing, except to your own products. And um, we've had people who basically had a Shopify store and were only making money because they were advertising all over Facebook and Google. And they're making more money from their blog now without having to pay YouTube and Google. Uh, it's just happening organically. But it took that work of creating the content up front. Miranda Cox. Um, whoa, it scrolled and I lost you there. Okay, there we go. Project 24 member here. Can non-product driven blogs still succeed in ranking if my niche is competitive and answers don't always have black and white solutions, but I format correctly? Um, yes, um, non-product focused blogs often do extremely well, um, especially because they're, they, I mean, it can be competitive, but they're they're not competitive in the same way. When we when there are products that are popular, it's common for just dozens and dozens and dozens of blogs to pop up around those products, and they're all creating the same kind of content. And it's like hard to we to get through all that noise and um, put out a piece of content that's better, um, and that Google recognizes as better and users recognize as better. And so um, when you're not in a really product focused niche. Um, ranking often ends up being a little bit easier. Um, again, depending on the niche, you know, like medical, financial tend to be pretty, um, pretty competitive. Um, and there are others as well. Now the black and white solutions thing. Yes, actually, I think when there's not a black and white solution, people are probably more likely to be searching and even reading potentially multiple articles to try to understand that topic from multiple perspectives. When I have something complicated that I am trying to understand and get an answer to, I often tend to read a lot of articles. And so even those that are ranking number three and number four, I'm clicking on and reading through um, and finding that, you know, the one that I found to be most trustworthy is kind of the one where I'll delve in a little bit further. And so um, I don't think that precludes you from doing well in the rankings. Um, if there's no product or buyer intent at all, it can um, that can have an impact on the earning potential, uh, especially for the passive income models like ads and affiliate. Um, but oftentimes, even in the non-product focused, like there are still affiliate products. There are still things that you can recommend to people. Um, thinking about like in the healthcare space, like there are affiliate programs for um, like online counselors. You know, there's affiliate programs for tons of things in the financial space. Um, and so there's affiliate programs for a lot of stuff. If you find a good product, you'd like to recommend to people in your niche, depending on what that is. All right. Um, I, like I get enough of these that I like kind of just wherever my eyes land, <laughs> that's where I'm going. Right. Um, John Farrar asks, are there great blog topics that do not reflect using our post scoring tools? 
Is there an alternate approach? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean with the post scoring tools. Um, but I would say that any sort of tool that you're using, whatever it is, um, there are still going to be topics outside of that that can do very, very well. I hope that makes sense. And so oftentimes we'll create you know, tools that are kind of shortcuts to help us identify good topics for blog posts. Everyone has their some version of it, right? Um, even our search analysis method. But even then, there's going to be stuff outside of that that could perform very well. And for that, um, it, it can be tough. We, to some extent, just kind of have to use our, our knowledge and intuition of the industry to have an idea of whether or not that seems like a reasonable topic for search volume. And then the competition analysis is going to be the same no matter what. Um, applicable innovation says Elementor versus Gutenberg. Never made a website in my life. Um, I do like the direction WordPress is going with their builders, but Gutenberg on its own is still not, not as powerful as I'd like it to be, to be like a full page builder. And so Elementor, even the free version of Elementor is going to add some really neat things. Um, Cadence Blocks is a plugin now that you can that you can use um, that goes with the Cadence theme, but you can use it even on other themes. Um, that's going to allow you to um, basically add a lot to the functionality of what you have uh, with Gutenberg. Um, Elementor being one. Um, other page builders, the Divi page builder I like. I use it a lot. Um, and they recently put out an update that is going to help improve a lot their uh, page loading speeds, um, where they've really struggled for a while because they're their theme is so powerful and the page builder so got so much stuff in it that it got a little bit bloated from a um, code standpoint. There you go. Um, John Blankensheen says, is the project 24 is the project 24 right for someone with little to no experience in blogging besides passively hearing about it from your channel and other podcasts and channels? Don't know where to start. Yes, the project 24 member is designed kind of to work no matter where you are. Um, but it's picking people up from the very beginning. So even with no like techie background at all, it's going to show you how to set up the site and get it going. We don't dive as much into the um, into the you know site design and really technical stuff, but there is a ton of awesome content um, on the web. Um, again, I mentioned earlier in the video, Adam from WP Crafter. There's some other YouTube channels as well that'll go through depending on specifically what you want to do. Um, they'll go through that for you. However, what we show is just a very simple, straightforward way to set up a website, um, make it look good and start getting content on it, which is kind of where we focus. That's the thing that matters the most in terms of getting traffic to your site. But over time, you'll find as you learn more stuff that you might want to start branching out and learning new things um, to be able to make your site extra cool. Um, Johnny nine says, hello, last time I asked you, uh, we're saying you're going to create Akabato forum for Akabato users Any ETA on that. Um, I don't have an ETA. It's something I want to do. Unfortunately, my to-do list, um, is fairly long, but, um, yes, it's something I want to do. And it's something I think that we'll do, um, pretty soon here, but, uh, I can't say exactly when that's going to happen. Okay. Um, Manner 122, is it normal to have only zero to three users per day after four months? I have 35 posts. It is normal to have very, very little traffic for several months. I will say it's also normal for um, on many sites to have some traffic um, in that time frame, you know, at four or five, six months to start having, you know, 10, 12, 15 users per day would be fairly normal. And so if you're not getting any yet, um, at this point, I would I would maybe start looking at that. If you're connected to Google Search Console, you could look and see if there's any issues there with your, with your content being indexed um, or any other issues that they've identified on your site that's maybe preventing it um, from, from getting traffic at this point. You may find that your content's indexed, but its ranking position is still just really, really low. Um, which is fairly normal for a new blog, depending on what niche you're in. And because of that, like you're just not getting a lot of impressions. People aren't seeing your article yet, and it just needs a little bit more time. Um, also, more content. As you add more content to the site, it adds to the overall authoritativeness. Um, and so create more content surrounding those topics you've already covered. Um, you know, build, build up. If you have multiple categories on your site, 
um, you know, make sure that there's multiple articles kind of in each sort of genre that you write about on your site. And you'll see that will improve quite a bit as well. Um, how much blog do I have to write in one year? Really? I mean, it kind of depends on what, what it is you're trying to do. For a lot of people, you're you're building something on the side, hoping to earn some money from it. Um, and so, you know, taking a, a little bit more casual approach to it is going to be fine. Um, if you're trying to build a business and you're trying to replace your job or you're trying to get an income and because you don't have one right now, um, you know, at that point, I'm going to pick it up quite a bit. The first 30 blog posts are very important before that. I mean, if it takes you a year to write 30, um, it's not going to move. Uh, you're not going to get any momentum going um, on your site. And it seems to prevent it from really getting noticed um, by the algorithms. And so um, what I would say is get those first 30 blog posts written as quick as you can. My recommendation in the first one to two months. Um, after that, I am okay with slowing down, but still within a year, I'd like to see somewhere in the 50 to 100 blog posts um, on most sites, depending on kind of where you are. Uh, I think that's totally doable. If you think about that, 100 blog posts is one every little over three and a half days. Uh, so about two a week. If you can write two blog posts a week for a year, especially if you crammed in a bit more at the very beginning, um, it's going to, it's, that's, I think that's doable, but I think that's kind of what it takes to be able to really make things happen. Um, and I wish I could get to everybody's questions. I really do. Um, let's see. Kibra asks, is mental health a good niche to go into? I think that's going to be a very tough niche. I think it's highly competitive. It's definitely considered YMYL, which is your money, your life. It, it impacts people's money and it, or, or their life. Uh, mental health is one that has a big impact on life. And so um, Google wants to make sure that the content is accurate and not going not gonna to mislead someone. And because of that, they lean heavily towards sites that are and content that's written by people who are authorities on the subject. Um, establishing yourself as that type of authority uh, takes time and a lot of work. So if you're at all new to blogging, I wouldn't go that direction. Okay. Um, Jana OP, Income School, does it help to be consistent in blog posting since day one where you get no visitors at all? Does it pay off later? Um, consistency is on blogging is less important, I would say, than just the amount of content. So, you know, publishing every two or three days. Um, has probably is probably a lot well is definitely a lot less important than just having 30, 40, 50 blog posts on a website. Um, and so I wouldn't worry as much about that. And where that matters is like I'm not gonna, you know, write 30 blog posts in the first two months, but spread them out so that they're every three days. Um, it just isn't that isn't important. Um, that said, consistency in the sense of consistently working. Um and just continuing to work at it and writing and writing and writing. I do think that that makes a difference. Not so much necessarily from an SEO standpoint, but from a, a personal standpoint of just putting in the work. So if you just build a, into your schedule a consistent time every day that you're just going to work on it and you're going to keep writing um, blog content, um, I think that that sort of routine is going to help you help a lot. Um, so there you go. Um, here go they keep popping in um lead with jim what do you think about someone who wants to start a contributor site like a version of forbes or huffington post except mine will be faith-based is there a chance of success um sure i think there's a chance of success um a contributor site in the sense of there are multiple contributors that write on the site who aren't owners of the site um they're writers yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we um, have often, and many members of Project 24 have had contributors on their sites in the sense of they hire a freelance writer to write an article here and there. Um, and over time, oftentimes that other writer um, kind of gets a, some authority on the subject. Um, we have hired before in, um, as freelance writers, people who have specific knowledge uh, in a particular niche who aren't necessarily writers by training. They're just um, they just know stuff about that topic. And that's actually done really, really well for us because we train them on the style of writing and then they go write for us. 
Um, and then those people, again, like they are one of the writers, one of the contributors on the site. Um, and that's, again, that's worked very, very well. And so if, the, if what we're saying now is like, okay, we're going to do something like that, except I'm not necessarily like paying them, they're just writing for the site. Um, or, um, and maybe it's just to kind of get their message out or their name out there or whatever it is to build up, you know, a reputation and some authority. Uh, maybe they are getting paid for the content, whatever it may be. Um, from Google standpoint, it's going to look the same. From the user standpoint, it's going to look the same. And it does work very well um, for them to do that. So, yes. Um, let's see. Um, what type of content should I post on a new Amazon affiliate website? Frequency and competition. From This is from a data expert. Um, first of all, I don't like to build Amazon affiliate websites specifically. Um, Amazon is still a good affiliate program. It's still one that probably makes more people more money, um, than most, uh, other affiliate programs directly, but there are a lot of other affiliate programs that make some people way more money even than that. And so, um, I don't like to just limit myself to, okay, what products from Amazon can I, can I put on my website? Um, I'd rather create a, a content-focused website, a topic-focused website. Um, I focus on creating good informational content, and then I link to products. Um, I you know find the products that I want to talk about, and I link to them. Um, right now, we're working on a, an affiliate marketing course for Project 24. Um, I just spent some time with Nate. We were sitting down talking about kind of the different approaches that we take to affiliate marketing and to linking to products. Um, and we were able to kind of define some specific areas um, and different ways that we approach that. And I think that's going to be really, really beneficial as we continue to kind of work through that. Um, again, it's things that we're doing, but now we're kind of wrapping definition around that to help others to be able to understand better um, what's working and, and what's not. Um, and so I don't take it from that approach of I'm building an affiliate site or I'm building an Amazon affiliate site. I take it from the approach of I'm building a site. Um, here's the topic of my site. I create content about that. Um, and so the type of content you want to create if you're trying to get into affiliate marketing is helpful informational content on topics people are actually searching for. Um, that's really what it all comes back to. Um, and then, uh, let's see, you asked content frequency and competition. Um, in general, if you're very, very product focused, especially for like successful products on Amazon, uh, you're going to have a lot of competition because that's what a lot of other people are targeting. They think that's where the money is. Um, and so oftentimes it does end up being very competitive and the content is actually not all that good or all that helpful. Um, again, we take kind of that side approach. We focus on answering specific questions people have on the web um, with our content and then linking to a product whenever that makes sense. And we actually end up doing better. Um, and then you incorporate other monetization methods too, ads and others. Um, content frequency. Again, the frequency matters a lot less than kind of the amount of content as well as um, how the content performs. You know, if I write one article that just nails um, a handful of really good search terms, I might get 10,000 page views a month from that one article. Uh, and that's really great. Um, and so the amount of content as well. I Again, a website for me, I'm, I'm focused on content, hard on content until at least 30 articles are up before I even worry about linking. Um, Beyond that, I'm still going to 50 to 100 articles before I'm really, you know, again, shifting too much away from content focus. Um, but at that point, maybe I'm monetizing more as I go. So there you go. And that's kind of what my first year looks like. After that, there's a lot of optimization that we can do with the content and with the monetization. All right. I got a few more minutes here. Um, some niches that newbies should stay away from. Um, this is a follow-up from Kibra. Um, basically most anything health and fitness related is just very, very saturated. Um, money is very, very saturated. Uh, there's, I mean, income school, I mean, it took us a long time to get income school off the ground and that was like six and a half years ago. Um, and it was YouTube that really did it for us. So if you do want to go into any of those areas, YouTube's going to be the place to start, um, focusing first. Okay. Um, other things I've kind of mentioned already, like getting very heavily product focused. Um, you know, I think 
I think you can build a site in a niche where obviously products are a big piece of it. Um, that's kind of like with, with Backfire, where Jim is right now. Products are a big part of that niche, but the topic isn't the products. The topic is the topic. And so um, by taking that approach, you open yourself up to being able to do a lot of product specific type of content, but the niche isn't very, isn't just product focused. If I made a site that was just blenders.com, you know, just all about blenders, and I'm, I'm not talking about like coding, I'm talking about like blenders for making smoothies, um, it's very product focused. And I'm going to find myself facing a lot of stiff competition, and it's going to be hard to create a lot of content that's not just specifically about products. Um, so those, those are really the big, big ones. Um, most everywhere else, I think you can find a spot, you can find a space. I may be missing a couple, but those are the ones that I just, um, would not recommend if you're getting started from on your first site. Uh, well, moving from, okay. Um, Sitham Fernando, well, moving from blogger to WordPress affect the sandbox period. Um, we call it, you know, we call it the sandbox. There's not officially like a sandbox. Um, and what the sandbox is and the duration of time really varies from niche to niche. And um, it varies so much. It's based on so many variables. It's really just kind of a testing period where <laughs> Google has no idea who you are and what your content is, like whether or not it has any sort of authoritativeness and people would trust it and like it. And so um, there's just a lot of very early testing um, going on. And so they don't, Call it, it's not really a sandbox, but it's what everybody refers to because most new sites seem to go through the ghost town phase is what we call it. So moving from Blogger to WordPress, I don't know that that's going to alone be the thing that impacts the sandbox period. However, I would not be building a site on Blogger. Um, having your own custom domain is just going to speak more to your authority, your authoritativeness, which... Um, I know it's weird. It's like, okay, pay some money, get your own domain, and now you're more authoritative than a site that's on Blogger. But that's maybe even mostly a perception that humans have, which impacts which articles they click on. And so um, that does end up impacting and could impact your time in the sandbox as well. Um, so there you go. Uh, maybe yes. But on the other hand, um, with like a Blogger or any of those other types of platforms, uh, you just what you're going to be able to do with your website is just extremely limited. Your monetization is going to be more limited. Everything's going to be more limited. And so I'd rather just start on WordPress from the very beginning. Um, let's see. Shiva Marora. Uh, I have written blogs of 3,000 words and main keywords ranking between 25 to 30 position. Total posts, I have 50. Um, please help an off-page. Website is eight months old. Domain authority is 35. So um, if the website's only eight months old, it's just, it's just young as a part of it. But um, really, the on-page stuff is the stuff that matters the most. Um, our, you know, how's the search analysis? How's our, com our competition? How is, you know, are these topics that people are searching? Like if you're ranking really, if you're ranking really well and not getting traffic, then that's a sign that there's just not a lot of search volume. In this case, you say you're ranking between 25 to 35. Um, to me, ranking above beyond about number 20 is the same thing as not ranking at all. Um, the, the number of impressions and the number of clicks you get are just going to be very low. But the fact that you're showing up at all shows that Google's doing something with that content. They're looking at it. Um, you may see organically that, that, that it moves up if your content really is better than your competition. Um, and so that's what I would do. I would say, you know, if I'm ranking number 25, let me look at the top 10 articles. Is my article actually a better resource than theirs? If it's not, then you need to go back to the content. If it is, okay, then at this point, maybe I do, um, maybe I do need to start um, some industry outreach, um, which to me would be just like, hey, I'm going to go get myself interviewed on a podcast. Maybe I'll reach out to some other blogs. Um, but frankly, I'm I'm more focused with the on-page stuff. That's what I would do. I would continue um, adding more content. I'd work on my interlinking between articles, um, and you know, take the few articles that are getting some traffic, and link from those to other articles that are related, um, and just get people to view more of the content on your site. Um, but again, if your content isn't a better resource, 
than what's than the stuff that's that's beating you in the competition uh, in the rankings, then that's where we need to get back to is back to the content. So there's a lot of things that could be going on there. That's I guess that's what I'm saying. All right. Um, my time's really up, but I'm going to take I think I'm going to take one more. Um, your thoughts on these back to back algo updates, June and July. Uh, link spam, core web vitals, etc. So on my way to 50,000 sessions, but now I'm back to 30,000. Um, yeah, so my thoughts on those updates. First of all, um, those, you know, any algorithm update is going to impact a lot more than just one thing. Um, obviously, the, the June, July algorithm updates were very heavily focused on uh, page experience, which included core web vitals. Um, that was an update that Google warned us about for a long time, mostly because they wanted us to make the changes proactively. Um, and also, I think because for most sites, it was actually going to have very little impact on their rankings. Um, and so uh, so they wanted us to do the work because it was going to make our sites better, but they didn't want um, uh, but they didn't want um, they didn't want the, the the a lot of sites to see like to just get hit by the algorithm update and have it have no impact on them, and then they would be like, okay, well, why am I going to worry about that kind of stuff, right? So basically, what they've said is that core web vitals, you know, page experience stuff, those are mostly tiebreaker type um, ranking signals, and so you know, if two sites um, have similar level of content, they're just they're they're both a great resource, but this one loads faster. Okay, cool. It's going to break the tie. But it's not something where, hey, if my website's a bit, a little bit slower, it doesn't totally pass. Um, you know, now all of a sudden, all of my rankings are going to tank. That's not the way it's supposed to work. And it's not the way it seems to have worked for most sites. However, some sites have seen big moves like yours. Um, and so when that happens, we just, we have to take a step back and look at what, you know, what is impacting it. Like, are are my core web vitals really bad? If they're you know if they're good, generally good and or close to the to the green range, then there's maybe something more to it than that. And every algorithm update, even the little ones they do like daily almost, um, are going to impact those sorts of things. And so there may be something else that was included in that algorithm update that wasn't really a headliner, but that impacted your site. And so that's what we just have to look at is what is it? Try to figure out. There's a lot of troubleshooting. What I'll often do is I'll look in my Google Analytics and I'll say, you know, was I hit across the board? Was it a handful of articles that were ranking well that now just aren't anymore? Um, but the traffic on the rest of my site stayed pretty consistent. Um, that's, again, those kinds of signals are going to help me understand what's going on. If it was totally across the board, um, there's a reasonable chance that there is something site-wide. And maybe it is that your page experience just needs to improve. Um, uh, if your site isn't mobile friendly, like it doesn't, it doesn't work well on mobile. That's a, that's a pass fail test nowadays. Same thing with having a, um, an SSL certificate, um, having a secure an HTTPS on your website, uh, is now a, a pass fail for Google. If you fail, well, then another site that has it, that's comparable to yours is going to outrank you. So I would look at those kinds of things. Um, all right, guys. Uh, that's going to do it for me today. Um, I wish I had more time again, and I wish I could get to everybody's questions. But I'm going to keep doing these um, as often as I can. So um, I guess stay tuned. And also, if you uh, if you go to the most, at least my most recent YouTube video, I think I pinned a comment in there. But I'm going to have it linked to in the description of videos going forward. Um, but I did start like a little, it's almost like a little survey just a couple of questions, but mostly it's just there for um, you to submit questions and topics that you'd like me to cover on the YouTube channel. And so even if you, you know, anybody watching this can't make it to a YouTube live to add, to get a question asked um, and answered by me, uh, feel free to submit it and we'll take time and make a nice video about it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I'm like still looking at questions. I, st I, I like, I'm like feeling an impulse to answer more of these, but I'll never end if I, if I don't. So, and I got to go film actually a video with Nate right now. So uh, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> see you.